Hello, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we are learning about the mission from the book of Luke, chapter 15. To follow along with the life notes, download them from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, let's hear from Pastor Chad Garrison. Have a seat and take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 is our text today. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1039, page 1039, and you'll be able to follow along with us in Luke 15. And as always, if you are here, you're in the room, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, there's Bibles in the seats around you. Take one of those, use it tonight, and then take it with you when you go. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online, we want you to have a Bible as well. If you don't have a Bible, then please ask us for one. We will get you a Bible. Just message us, uh, message the service host, send us an email, calvaryaz.com. We'd be glad to get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, I hope you guys are excited about life groups because life group signups are upon us. Uh, and if you are in a life group, you know how valuable they are. Uh, I'll just tell you, uh, Meralda and I have been leading a life group for 12 years, and it's been phenomenal. It's been life-changing. Uh, it is uh, the place where we have friends. It's a place where we pray for each other. We encourage each other. We rejoice together. We weep together. Uh, we see God work in our lives. We celebrate. We grieve. All of those things are part of it, but that's, that's kind of the family of faith piece of it. And if you're not in a life group, can I encourage you to check one out? Overcome the fear. If you, you know, to me, I'm an extrovert. So someone's saying, I'm afraid to go into somebody's house. I don't know. <laughs> you know, ah, come on, bring it on. That sounds fun. <laughs> but if you're a little bit nervous, don't be. We, we hide the mean people. Uh, so... <laughs> And if you're hidden, then you understand why. But anyway, so um, check out life groups. We would love to, I, look, life change happens in the context of life groups. And I believe that, and I would love for you to experience that. So happy new year. Happy new year. I know, it's the first weekend of 2024. Can you believe it? It's 2024. And, and so, you know, we were greeting earlier, and it's like, is it too far into the new year to say happy new year? Or is it okay to say that still? So I don't care. It's the first weekend. I'm saying happy new year, so we can get over it. But 2024 begins my 32nd year as pastor of Calvary. Isn't that crazy? And, and I am thankful that God allows me to serve him in this place, even though it wasn't my plan. Can I, can I just tell you, I mean, my plan was when I got here 32 years ago was uh, to be at Calvary for three or four years, uh, learn how to be a pastor, make some mistakes, and then move to, as I would put it back then, a real church in a real city. <laughs> and I say that because I am an idiot, uh, and God's like, you poor moron, let me just teach you some things and leave you here. Uh, and uh, and thank, thankfully, God did not listen to my prayers along the way. And, uh, and I, I appreciate his plan because it's way better than mine. And in these past three decades, we've seen God do some amazing things. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, for those of you that are newer and you don't know some of the story, I mean, when I came, Calvary had about 90 people. Uh, now on a weekend, with, including online and in person, we have over 3,000 people participating. Uh, we've baptized, uh, yeah, it's kind of, kind of fun. Kind, kind of fun. We have life groups as big as the church uh, that uh, when we got here. Um, we baptized uh, almost 2,500 new believers, 1,000 new believers in the last five years. Now, see, that's what I get excited about. 1,000 new Christians in the last five years. Um, we've given over 5 million to missions just in the past decade. Uh, and I love being the pastor of Calvary. And, and because of what God has done, a lot of people now will say, well, well Pastor, how... Uh, did, did that happen? How did Calvary get to this place? And I, my answer is always really simple. The mission of Christ is the main thing at this church. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and that drives everything that we do. 
So today, as we kick off a new year, I want us to look at a very familiar passage that fuels my fire for the mission, and, and I want you to get it. I want you to understand that, that reason that we do what we do, and, I, and really, honestly, I want you to join us in doing that. Many of you already have. Some of you are still checking us out, kind of going, okay, uh, what is this life group cult you guys talk about, and what's this mission that you guys are involved in? Uh, so I want you to listen in and, and understand it a little bit better. Luke chapter 15 beginning at verse 1. And, and understand the setting that goes into this because that's the setting that, that sets off Jesus. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. They complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance." Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. First thing I want you to know is the mission is the priority of heaven. The mission is the priority of heaven. You know, as you listen to the parables that Jesus told, it is about finding the lost sheep. It is about searching and finding the lost coin. And, and that action took precedence over everything else they were doing. You know, we have to find it. And when they found the last coin, when they found the sheep, what did they do? They rejoiced. They celebrated. They threw a party. Hey, they invited their friends. Hey, celebrate with me. Look, this is what we're all about. We want to celebrate. And I just want you to know that conversion is cause for joy. Conversion is cause for joy. Heaven rejoices when what happens? One sinner repents. Heaven rejoices. Heaven throws a party when, when one person says, hey, you know what? I'm going to return to Jesus. I'm going to come to Jesus. I'm going to trust in Jesus. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I choose to surrender, and heaven throws a party. Now, the, the, the temptation is to celebrate the wrong things. In fact, uh, when we as a church start to value what heaven doesn't celebrate is when we get off track. And, and since 80% of evangelical churches in America are declining, that means that a lot of churches are celebrating the wrong things. And, 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 uh, and it's easy when I, when I go into churches and I, and I start talking to them and they start talking about the things that are really important to them. And you realize that while they say evangelism is, evangelism is important to them, they don't actually do anything to communicate the fact that that is their priority. And, and I'm just like, hey, the mission is the priority of heaven. Uh, so again, most of you weren't around in the 1990s, so let me tell you a little bit uh, about Calvary's story. So I got here in 92. I was 29 years old, didn't have a clue. And, uh, but I, I knew that we're supposed to reach people, so we started doing church, you know. Uh, and, and what happened was there's was a lot of people moving to Havasu at that time, still are. And people were moving in, and they were looking for a church. And we grew mostly by collecting Christians that were looking for a church. Okay, I'm just being really honest. I mean, yes, we baptize people, uh, usually 15 to 20 a year. So, you know, it was, we were still, you know, reaching people. But most of the growth was people just looking for a church. Oh, we like this church. We're going to grow. We're going to join this church. And after 10 years, the church had grown to about 500 people. And, and everywhere I went, you know, in the state, when I was meeting with leaders and something, they were celebrating what God was doing at Calvary, everybody but me. Can I just be honest with you? I, you know, in my quiet time with God, I was like, God, I don't think you're impressed. I don't think this is what the, you know, I don't think heaven's throwing a party because people move to have a zoo and join a church. They're already saved. They're already in the family. We weren't, we weren't seeing the, the cause for joy. What we were doing is collecting Christians. We weren't celebrating conversions. 
And after 10 years, uh, I repented. I said, God, this, isn't, it, this doesn't impress you. It doesn't impress me because uh, it doesn't impress you. So uh, we're going to shift. And we started a modern service. You guys are attending the descendant of that now. We didn't think we had room at our, at our campus, so we started at the high school. And, and we said, hey, you know what? We're going we're gonna to dress down. <laughs> we're going to be casual. I used to be suit and tie people. <laughs> yeah, there's photo evidence, so I can't deny it. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we dressed down. It wasn't this dress down at the beginning, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I like casual. And, and we said, hey, you know what? We're going to target people who don't go to church instead of church people. And, uh, and, and things just took off. And within about 16 months, that one service at the high school was bigger than our two services at our McCulloch campus. And then they kicked us out of the high school and we took over the McCulloch campus and uh, went from three services to four services to five services and built this. And, and everything changed. Uh, and then we started serving the, the community. You know, we said, hey, let's do projects out here and let's just serve the community and let's paint schools and let's, you know, fix things up and let's give away food and let's do whatever we can. And people said, well, when are we gonna preach? And we said, we're not. Well, when are we going to pass out tracts? And it's like, we're not. Well, how are they going to know that we're Christians? Uh, they, they know. They know who we are. And there were some people who didn't like it, and they left. And there were some people who said, hey, this is really cool, and they joined. And, and God has done a work, uh, you know, through that. But here's the thing. The lost sheep and the lost coin, the, the, the people in the story were actively looking for what was lost. They left their comfort. They made an effort by cleaning the house to find what was lost. That is the heart of Jesus. Luke chapter 19, uh, story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. He ends it by saying, the son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost. I think that was Jesus' clearest mission statement, doing his ministry, teaching his words. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. The mission is the priority of heaven. But since Jesus was addressing religious leaders, did you catch that at the beginning? They were grumbling because sinners were coming to Jesus and he wasn't sending them away. Uh, he didn't stop there. He continued the stories with a really famous one. It's called the prodigal son. You guys heard of it? Anybody heard of it? Okay, some of you don't. Like, I don't need to raise my hand for that one. So we're gonna continue on. Uh, we're gonna walk through it and, and just see what else Jesus has to tell us. So let's continue there at verse 11. And Jesus said, because he didn't stop at the, you know, verse 10. Uh, th these are added later. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between the two sons. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He's a Jewish boy. This is not a good job. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. That's the bottom of the barrel, folks. A Jewish boy wanting to eat pig slop. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now, I just want to pause right there. And I just want you to, to see that the prodigal son demonstrates rebellion confession, and repentance. I mean, he covers all the bases right here in these few verses, right? I mean, he starts off as a disrespectful child who is bent on evil. I mean, when he asks for his inheritance, he's basically saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I mean, you don't get much more disrespectful than that. Dad, I wish you were dead. I want my money now. And his dad gives it to him. That is the unthinkable. Everybody here in the story is shocked. Why would a father do that? He should just beat his son and send him away and disown him. I mean, that's, that's what they're thinking. That's what any respectable Jewish rabbi would do. And so they're thinking, wow, that's crazy. But this disrespectful son is bent on rebelling against his father's values. And by the way, we have all been the prodigal. We've all been the prodigal. 
I mean, Scripture tells us so, right? Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, there is no one righteous, not even one. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We've all been the prodigal. We've all rebelled against God. Maybe it was a little bit. Maybe it was a lot. Maybe it was crazy big. Maybe you've got one of those dramatic made-for-TV stories. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. We've all been the prodigal. And Jesus is trying to paint that picture for us. And I say this, you've all been the prodigal because at some point, at some point, we recognized our sin, we confessed it to God, we expressed repentance, and we surrendered to his leadership. Because if you haven't done that, you need to check out your relationship with God. Can I, can I just be really honest? If you've had that life-changing relationship with Jesus, it means that you came to your senses, you repented of your sin, you confessed it, and you said, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need you to change my life, and he did. Okay, that's, that's the point where you come to your senses. And, and I'm sure that the religious leaders listening did not identify with the prodigal. That's why Jesus is telling the story. They didn't identify with the prodigal. They were like, oh, that's a bad kid. You, just, you should just destroy him. But I hope you can identify with the prodigal. I hope you can identify that time in your life that you came to your senses. In fact, one of your assignments should be uh, over dinner or over lunch or over breakfast or whenever you get together with your friends and family, maybe at your life group next week, share when you came to your senses. What was your moment when you woke up and you're standing there at the pig pen and you went, no more. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm gonna surrender to Jesus. I'm going home. So the prodigal demonstrated rebellion and confession and repentance. I mean, is there any better repentance than, Dad, I'm not worthy to be called your son? I want to be treated as one of your servants. Man, that's the heart of repentance, isn't it? But the story doesn't end there, right? Let's continue on. Pick up at verse 20. So he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him straight from the pig pen. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. You see, the father demonstrates grace and restoration. The father demonstrates grace and restoration. Did you notice there is no stern lecture from the father? There is no I told you so moment. And at this point, I go, not me. I'd have been like, you understand what you've done. All right, come on, let's confess. How many of you would be there with me? Point the finger. Yeah, we would because, I mean, that's our nature, right? You idiot, look what you've done. Look at the money you've wasted. Look at all this stuff, all this time. I hope you learned your lesson, right? But the father in the story doesn't do that. He, in an undignified way, he runs to his son, throws his arms around his stinking, filthy boy, kisses him, and then says, hey, get him a robe, get him a ring, Get in some shoes. Oh, by the way, let's throw a party because my son was lost and now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. You see, the father rejoices in his son's repentance. He offers forgiveness. And the really surprising thing is he restores him to his place in his family. That's what the ring was about. Put the family ring back on him. I know he hawked the other one that he had. But let's give him the ring. Let's let him know he belongs with us. He's one of us. He's my son. I just want you to know, this is a picture of God's uncomfortable grace. Uncomfortable grace is one of the core values here at Calvary. We believe that the mercy, the incredible, uh, just unfathomable mercy of God that applies to us, applies to everyone. That's a picture of it. That boy did not deserve that grace. He did not deserve to be welcomed. He did not deserve to be restored. Uh, you see, forgiveness is a gift that God offers to us. It is not a reward that is earned. We have to get this if we want to understand God's grace and understand God's heart. 
Salvation is a gift that God gives to me and you. It is not a reward that we earn. By the way, remember his audience is Pharisees that are complaining about him hanging out with sinners and Jesus wants them to get it. It doesn't matter how good you are, you can't get there on your own. You need help. You're not gonna be good enough. You're not gonna earn it. Nobody does. It's, it's uncomfortable grace from God to us. All the son did in the story was come home. He came home. Some of us need to come home. Need to stop playing a game. Need to stop living in the pig pen. Doesn't matter if you show up for church or not, tune in or not, you know. But see, all you need to do to receive the mercy of God is to come home, embrace Jesus. He forgives you and he includes you in his family. And here's the thing, he knows your rebellion. He's not daunted by that. Let's go a step further. He doesn't just know what you've done. He knows what you think about doing. Okay, that, that ought to freak you out. They didn't preach this much when I was growing up. Because we knew that, you know, other people could see what we did, but other people couldn't see what we thought. And, you know, when I was growing up, I thought I was the only one who was that sick, twisted, and perverted as a young man loving Jesus. Because they didn't talk about it. I thought, well, no one else is like this. I'm really evil. So, uh, by the way, just for the record, I know you guys are evil. Okay. <laughs> There's, like, all I do is I just go, you guys are probably half as evil as I am. You're sick, twisted people. <laughs> just saying. But God's grace is enough for us. In all of that, he still loves us and he wants us in his family. That is incredible. That is, that's the good news right there, right? That's why we can rejoice because that's why God's throwing a party. One sinner repents, right? One sinner comes home. Let's throw a party. Let's celebrate. Um, by the way, even, even if you're still doubting whether God will welcome you, I just want you to know he will welcome anyone who comes to him. That's why the Apostle Paul said, look, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Every single person who gets to that place where they come to their senses and they say, I need mercy, I need forgiveness, I'm not worthy. Yes, you're not worthy. That's why you get the gift of salvation. And by the way, this is why it's so important for all of us to invite our friends and family to church. That's why we want to invite our neighbors and our coworkers and the people we hang out with. You know, all those groups that you go, you know, four-wheeling with or motorcycle riding with or playing sports with, all your pickleball cult friends, all of that. <laughs> that's, that's why it's so important to invite them because God's grace is for everyone and God can change anybody's life. Do you believe that God can save anyone? Yes. All right, see, I like that. You guys are sure about it. I've asked that question in churches that I've preached in, and sometimes I'm met with silence. And then they kind of answer, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we, yeah, we do. But one of the problems in those 80% of churches that are declining is that people have lost faith in the reality that God can change anybody's life. I mean, we, we know it here, but we don't believe it here. Because we read the Bible and read about guys like the Apostle Paul, right? He's the poster child for immediate conversion, radical change of direction in life. And so we, we believe that, oh yeah, it happens in the Bible, but believing that God does it today in this place at this time is what gets us to bring our friends. And, and see, I believe it because I've been a witness to it over and over and over and over again. In fact, you know, what I tell people is Calvary is a church that is filled with people who are the last person you'd ever expect to see in church. So let's just do a little experiment. How many were, of you were the last person anyone thought was they'd see in church? See, look at these hands going up all over the place. See, that's evidence of God's life-changing power. You're living proof that God can save anyone, even people that others have given up on. That's right. And by the way, the dad didn't punish his son for being an idiot. I, I mean, I love that because I've been in churches where they'll like welcome anyone, but if you've been the real prodigal, they will put you in a special room. I mean, they don't actually do that. They're like, oh, it's so great to see you, but they don't trust you because you're not like one of them. They always marginalize you or kind of, you know, you're, you're not going to be put in leadership or anything like that. Around here, we think, oh, the more broken you were and the more greater God's redemption, ah, we'll put you in leadership. Let's do that. Because you know grace, you get it. You see, the Father demonstrates grace and restoration. 
But there's one more person in the story, and we have to see him, and that's the older brother. Pick up verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. So the older brother was angry and refused to go in, but his father came out and entreated him. But the older son answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never even gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for your, your, this brother. This your brother was dead and is alive. He is lost and is found. You see, the older brother is judgmental and angry. The older brother is judgmental and angry. Now, he has a complaint that on one level is valid because he's been doing all the work. The brother wasted resources. He comes home, gets a party, and it's not fair. And it's not fair, right? Right? There's a lot of you that'd be like, yeah, I'd be kind of ticked off too. That isn't fair. I've been doing the work. I've been carrying the load. I've been doing his work and my work. And now he comes home and you throw a party. See, here's the thing. Grace isn't fair. It isn't fair. And, and you know what? I don't want fair. I want grace. Because you know what fair means? Fair means that we all go to hell. That's what fair means. You want justice? I don't want justice. Do you want justice? Justice means we all go to hell. Because we've all rebelled. We've all defied God. We are all unclean. We are all unworthy. So um, you can want fairness all you want. I want grace. I'm going to celebrate grace. And, and, and here's the thing. When we get grace, it changes our attitude. Now, here's a couple of things about the older brother. Obviously, he's been living as a servant, not as a son. He did not understand his relationship with the father. The father gave both the boys everything, but the, the older brother didn't get it. He thought he was still working for dad, and he's like, you're working for yourself, you moron. Um, he didn't get it. He didn't embrace the freedom that he had. And most importantly, he did not share his father's heart. He didn't share his father's heart. Jesus, at this point, wants the religious leaders to identify with the tragic older brother. He's wanting them to get it. He, he wants them to see it. They were judgmental. Others aren't as holy as we are. They're not as faithful as we are. And they didn't like Jesus associating with the sinners and tax collectors. And they were outraged that Jesus had the audacity to heal people on the Sabbath. Those sick people can wait. They didn't like it. Now, here's how that impacts us as followers of Jesus. Joy and judgment don't coexist. They are not playmates. They're not. One's going to win in our hearts. Either we will judge people for their failures or we will rejoice at their repentance. That's what's going to happen in us. We're either going to judge people because they fail or we're going to rejoice because they repent. And, and by the way, angry people miss out on the joy of Jesus. Angry people, are, they're missing out on the whole joy of Jesus. They, they don't know how to celebrate. And by the way, angry people make the bride of Christ really ugly. I've been in churches filled with angry people. They're outraged about everything and everyone and this and that's happening. And, and sometimes you just want to go, hey, turn off the news, read your Bible and celebrate. Jesus is, you know, he's the king. He won. We're on the winning team. Stop whining about everything. But angry people miss out on the joy of Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What is more likely to be found in your life? Joy or judgment? Because only one is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Are, are you more likely to get angry or to join the party? Are you going to complain or are you going to celebrate? You see, because you're not gonna do both really well. Jesus identifies with the Father in this story, obviously. And we aren't really following Jesus well if we act like the older brother. 
In fact, if we act like the older brother, we're following the Pharisee's example and not Jesus. Heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. The father threw a party when his son repented. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on the party. So as a church, we're going to seek for the lost. We're going to celebrate when they choose to follow Jesus. And I pray that you choose to join with us in this mission of life change. Because if you don't really like that whole idea of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, you're not going to be thrilled being here at Calvary. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thanks for leaving the 99 and searching for us. Thanks for turning the house inside out and upside down to, to find us. And thank you for celebrating when, when we surrendered to you. So God, right now, uh, some of us need to come to our senses and repent and come home. Some of us need to repent of being judgmental towards our neighbors. And some of us need, just need to join the party. So God, we're yours. And we really do surrender because you're the one who can make the dead come alive. You're the one who can take our brokenness and turn it beautiful because you're the God who can turn graves into gardens. And we need you to do that in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just like the father celebrated the return of his rebellious son, God rejoices when one of his wayward children repents and comes to him. Jesus' story beautifully demonstrates how he runs to us with outstretched arms when we turn from living our lives for our own selfish desires to him for restoration and salvation. He longs for us to go to him. If you are far from God, please don't hesitate to go to him. You won't face wrath. Quite the opposite. You'll be greeted with open arms of love. Have a great week. Bye-bye.